John Bennett from Broadcasting from Miami. Sorry we're a little late. Kristen had to go to the hospital on an emergency. Uh, we have tonight with us Zia Lu, who's going to talk about uh, biochips for better cancer therapy. Uh, initially, uh, Zia is going to go through his paper, and then afterwards, Kristen and I will ask questions, mostly Kristen, since he knows the topic of uh, nanomedicine better than me. Um, there's a live tweet board to the right of, of the uh, screen as you're watching, so feel free to tweet any questions. So, uh, okay, I'll turn it over to Zia. Go ahead, Zia. Okay, so uh, how do you want me to uh, present? Do you want me to yeah, open so the paper, share it? Or? Yeah, yeah, so Zia, the way, the way we typically like, me and John like to do this is, um, you know, we, uh, I'll try to, so, you know, we welcome the audience again. It's uh, another exciting week. I think, you, you know, certainly, um, what we're hoping to get out of this is the setup is, you know, we'll, you can start by giving a little bit of introduction to everybody, who you are, kind of where your educational background is, mm -hmm. uh, and then you can present the main main parts of your paper, and mm -hmm. certainly I'll try to jump in and ask you questions if I think it would help us understanding the technology, mm -hmm. um, and then towards the end of the show, uh, what we'd like to do is certainly uh, open it up to commentary on kind of the major significant findings from the past week, and John's going to put up some papers, um, and what we'll be able to do is I think we'll try this feature called Share Desktop that I think will allow you to, if you want, present some of the figures from your paper directly mm -hmm. on the, um, to the public and whoever's watching this. So mm -hmm. um, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, kind of give us a quick introduction. Um, I know that John had mentioned that um, you're going to present a very nice seminal work that you did at University of Michigan, but uh, mm -hmm. give us a quick backdrop about where you're from and kind of what got you interested in nanomedicine research and things like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Christian. So, uh, my name is uh, Xia Lu. I'm from University of Michigan. Uh, I was in the Department of uh, Electrical Engineering. So, actually, I'm not uh, a that expert on nanotechnology or nanomedicines or biology or chemistry, but I work with uh, these people. Uh, we have a lot of uh, different uh, collaboration here because uh, University of Michigan is a comprehensive university. You can find all kinds of uh, department, all kinds of people doing different kind of research here. So uh, collaboration is comparatively uh, easier for a place like this. And uh, basically, I work on uh, biochips, which means we make uh, a lot of different chips for biomedical applications. And the paper I'm going to describe today is about uh, a uh, chip I make for uh, drug screening, and it's for uh, cancer drug screening, especially. Uh, we tested it. Uh, we tested it uh, with uh, some cancer drugs, which is uh, in the format of small molecules. Uh, we also have uh, tested some nanoparticles. Uh, these nanoparticles are from uh, our collaborators' groups. And uh, we published uh, one paper about those kind of nanoparticle tests on another journal. Uh, and we are preparing another one, uh, country. And uh, the paper I'm going to talk about today is more uh, uh, about uh, how the chip works for testing uh, the drug's efficiency on the cells. But uh, I guess you can surely feel how it might also work for nanoparticles. Thanks. So, so uh, before you start, so like, what your where were you originally born? Where are you from originally? What part of? Oh uh, yes, uh, I was born uh, in uh, I was born in China mainland. Uh, my hometown is a small town beside Shanghai. Uh, I guess you know Shanghai. <laughs> yes, yeah. yeah. And uh, and I, uh, it's pretty routine for me. I went to elementary school, middle school, high school there, and then I attend the uh, big exam all over the nation, and I uh, went to uh, Peking University in Beijing uh, for my uh, undergraduate, and uh, uh, both, uh, both I got my both um, master degree and the bachelor degree there uh, in electrical engineering, and uh, yeah, so 
from the senior uh, period of my undergrad, uh, undergraduate, uh, I started working on the clean room, uh, working in the clean room there, uh, studying making different kinds of chips. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. And then you you came to University of Michigan to do your postdoc, uh, and uh, plan is to do faculty position after or. Uh, actually, I I came to U.S. in two thousand seven. Uh, mm -hmm. First, I first I uh, I went to uh, University of Minnesota. Actually, I joined the group there, and after one year, uh, my boss uh, he he was a, a Michigan graduate, and he uh, came back to Michigan. And he uh, also brought him brought me back to Michigan, and uh, uh, I. I uh, from 2007 I was I has been uh, I have been working in his group on um, uh, making these kind of chips. Uh, actually, I got a chance uh, to uh, Robert Langer's talk. Uh, he came to University of Minnesota uh, to give a talk on uh, nanotechnology. I think uh, in 2007, and I went to his talk. At that time, we have some. Collaborator, they're working on uh, nanotechnology too. I even tried to make some nanoparticles my, myself by uh, by the emulsion method. But after that, I came to uh, Michigan and I, I I cannot do that collaboration anymore. And I, I found another collaborator who's also working on nanotechnology here in Michigan <laughs> and uh, start working on. Uh, something else, yeah. but also related with nanotechnology. Yeah, sure. No, I mean it's it's um, you know as we kind of appreciate what kind of research you do, it's nice to know your background, what kind of led you to, you know, this generation is this the kind of people staying in science and medicine is slowly dwindling because it's hard. It's very difficult to get funding to see some of all the stuff, exciting things that you're doing. Um, Finally, have clinical relevance, so it's nice to hear people's background, where they're coming from, and uh, it's exciting. So, why don't you take it away? Take, tell us a little bit about your research. Um, you know, present the paper. Then me and John will certainly field questions from our uh, Twitter people, but certainly we pose some questions for you. Okay, sure, uh, no problem. So, uh, I think I think uh, I can start with the drug we are using. So. Uh, the drug we are using is a little special. It's not uh, that like the normal uh, chemotherapy drug. It's a drug uh, used for the therapy which is called uh, photodynamic therapy, which means this kind of drugs, uh, usually it doesn't work. It cannot kill the cells uh, in normal conditions. It should be activated by, by some kind of light, for example, uh, red light. Then it can be activated then it can work and kill the uh, cancer cells. So this kind of therapy, uh, it's comparatively new therapy compared to like surgery, uh, 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 chemotherapy or uh, radiotherapy, and uh, uh, it's having some uh, benefits. Like uh, because it's like it's light activate. So uh, it's kind of localized therapy. So uh, you can confine the light illumination on the tumor position, and you can affect only that area. And also, this kind of uh, photodynamic therapy drugs, usually it's uh, having a smaller side effect <laughs> uh, compared to uh, normal drugs. And also, uh, it's a very cheap therapy. So uh, countries like China, uh, uh, you, uh, usually they might use it more because it's uh, very cheap, uh, it's very low cost, and also, mm, mm, yeah, I, I think uh, basically uh, that's it. And the counter condition of this kind of therapy is uh, from the beginning of this, it's used for skin cancer because it's very easy to introduce light to the skin. And currently, people are moving this uh, into the application of all kinds of different cancers, but uh, it hasn't uh, been widespread yet. Uh, your researches are going on. Currently, in US, there are three kinds of uh, drugs has been approved by FDA for this kind of therapy. 
and more kind of drugs, including nano drugs, uh, are under development. And also the the other hot top, uh, topic is to uh, carry out more uh, tests to spread its application to all kinds of cancers because uh, if you have dif uh, if there's different kind of cancer, the condition is different. For example, the light delivery uh, will be pretty different. Sure. And uh, yeah. Right, right. Yeah. So, uh, so uh, we we start our collaboration with uh, the group from uh, chemistry department here, and they the challenge we was facing at that time because uh, this kind of drug is uh, is good or this kind of therapy is pretty good, but uh, the drug development or the drug testing is. Uh, a bit challenging because uh, you cannot just put the drug to the cells and see whether the cell is killed or not. It's not that easy because it's affected by the light and it's also affected by the oxygen level because the detail mechanism is the uh, light will excite the uh, drug and the drug in turn will excite the oxygen into some high energy level molecules and that kind of very active oxygen molecules will kill the cancer cells at the end. So there are three uh, essential factors here. One is drug, one is light, and one is oxygen. So the normal drug test is a bit more complicated because you need to give the drug, and also you need to give the light, and also you need to uh, control the oxygen. And uh, you can imagine, uh, maybe you can imagine doing that using conventional way, using a Petri dish or a 96 well plate. Uh, it's not so easy. There are not very readily available equipment or methods. You can apply a fixed, for example, oxygen condition. And uh, you, you can only, for example, if you use light source, a normal light source, or usually you can only test one kind of light illumination intensity at one time. Mm -hmm. So uh, the throughput is also a problem. For example, if you do it one by one, you may you might only get like ten points for a whole day's work, uh, and that's very bad for the drug development because once people made a new drug, no matter it's a molecule drug or nanoparticle drug, uh, people want to know very quickly how it works, how how good it is. Uh, this kind of cycle is very important to be short to accelerate this kind of uh, development process. So at that time, we think we can introduce the uh, biochip technology or the uh, microfluidic technology uh, to help this, because this kind of technology, it has a lot of uh, biomedical applications, actually. And it's having two major advantages to help uh, this. One is uh, it usually can provide a method of high throughput because it's a very small chip and uh, you can have a lot of, uh, it's kind of a uh, uh, miniaturized uh, 96 well plate or something. You can have a lot of um, chambers or separated uh, cultured cells and test it under different conditions. And also another thing is it's comparatively easier to control the environment there, especially the microscale environment uh, for the cells. And uh, you can integrate the uh, uh, control capability, like the, for the light, also for the oxygen, and the, uh, also for the drugs. You can control their concentration, the illumination, uh, light intensity, and the oxygen uh, levels, and see how uh, the job works under different kind of these uh, conditions. So, uh, I mean, so, so what basically we're doing is um, there might be a screen for different jobs to kind of kind of do things that happen in the Sorry, I can't, can't hear very clearly. So you're basically using mechanisms for different types of jobs that's kind of feed out uh, your high voltage assay, how they're exactly working. Uh, uh, can you hear sorry. that, Tia, at all? I can't uh, hear. No, I, well, I can't. You know, hear. 
Can you can you can you write that, uh, Kristen? The question. Can you write it on the chat on the chat board, please? It might be better because I'm having a hard time hearing you also. Okay, and you know how the chat board works, right, Zia? Mm -hmm. Mm hmm Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we need more bro broadband. Mm -hmm. Google needs more. I guess it's a pretty busy night in Michigan yeah. and uh, Michigan and Miami. I don't know. Is it because it's too far away? <laughs> No, because we broadcast to Ukraine, and uh, it's it, you can never tell. Usually, uh, okay. it's a use of people. A lot of people on. Okay, on, I mean, uh, if you can hear in query, you can. I mean, help me repeat the the question or something. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so the question is: uh, You are creating a screen for deducing. Uh, drug mechanisms. Uh, uh, basically, I think uh, uh, maybe not uh, drug uh, mechanisms. I mean, uh, we already know uh, the drug mechanisms, uh, how how the drug works to kill the uh, cancer cells. But uh, it's more likely we want to know uh, how well uh, the drug works. Uh, for example, uh, if we have two, uh, yes, uh, PDT is uh, clinically used. Uh, I think uh, it is uh, it is a therapy option. Uh, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, uh, I haven't went to the hospital yet to see whether they are providing that kind of, but I, I, I'm sure it is uh, clinic, clinically provided. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Does that answer your question, Christian? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I think, uh, that would, you know, I think it helps kind of put some relevance to this loose research in terms of the larger public and patient. Okay. Okay, see ya. Mm -hmm. You want to continue? Uh, yes. Were you, were you going to do a screen share of your presentation, or? Uh, yeah, I, I can. I mean, that might be better. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that mm -hmm. might help uh, understand a little bit better, since okay. we are having a, a few audio problems. Okay. That might help. We could try it. See how it goes. Okay. So. Sometimes, uh, it, helps. Sometimes it always helps to have images and graphics, because these are very tough concepts. Okay. It's sure. Easier to see, see some of this stuff. Okay, I think I think uh, I don't need to talk all the details about the writings of the paper. I might just uh, go through the yeah, go through uh, the yeah. Yeah, just yeah. go through the main parts of the paper. Main parts of it, yeah. This is more for just. I mean, I think most of the audiences are going to be a lot relatively non-science people, mm -hmm. or at least they want to appreciate science. So we'll try to distill it down to something that you know, mm -hmm. general public can also understand. So just the main points are important. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Sure. No problem. So uh, I'm going to do the screen share. Uh, let me see. This is your first time on national TV that you've done a screen share. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> okay. Don't so I guess you can see my screen now. Okay. Yes. Okay. So you can see this image. Uh, yes. Yes. So yes. basically, the left side uh, is the schematic drawing of, of my chip. And the right side is uh, basically a mechanism of how this kind of therapy works. So for example, we have uh, cancer cells here. And we will apply this kind of drugs to it, which is usually called a photosensitizer. And uh, also, at the same time, we need to have the oxygen along. And we illuminate uh, red light here to excite these kind of drugs, and in turn, excite the oxygen. And this kind of excited oxygen, uh, it can kill the cancer cells. And as I said previously, we need to first we need to control these three parameters. So we made three different chip layers. Uh, one layer is the gas layer, which we can apply oxygen, and uh, 
this kind of oxygen can diffuse into the cell culture medias to allow the cells. So it would be the exact oxygen condition as we apply it. And also the center layer is the cell culture layer. It's also the layer where we apply the drugs or deliver the drugs uh, to the uh, cells. And at the bottom layer, we are applying an uh, optical layer. It's an optical filter layer. So it can modify the illumination light intensity because we want a feature of high throughput. For example, uh, on one chip, we might want to do hundreds or even more than a thousand different conditions. So we applied uh, gener a gradient generation structure in each layer. So for the gas layer, we can generate nine levels of oxygen levels. Uh, of oxygen. And in the uh, cell layer, we can generate nine levels of drug concentration. And in the optical filter layer, it is composed of what we call grayscale masks. So it has different transparency at different area, so it will have different illumination intensity. So let me see. Um, so this figure here. Let me enlarge it. So this is a cross-section view uh, of the chip. Uh, so basically, the bottom one is the filter layer. And it's, it is having different uh, thickness of the uh, light path. So we will apply light absorption dye inside. So it will generate different levels of light illumination. And also, this is a center layer for the cell culturing and the drug, and the uh, gas layer, which we apply the oxygen, and it can diffuse to the bottom uh, cell layer to the uh, cancer cells and the drugs. And this is the uh, uh, assembly process of these three layers uh, of our chip. Uh, yeah, basically, is overlapped in a spectacular way so that we can combine all these different uh, conditions together. So uh, we can apply uh, nine oxygen levels to each kind of uh, drug uh, levels. And the same works for the uh, filter layer. So the total condition is uh, time, uh, is multiplied them together. So it's nine times nine times uh, 16, like along 1,000 conditions. And I'm going to show, this is a, a microfabrication process. And this is a, a, a actual device, uh, what we will get uh, at the end. So the central area uh, is around 5 millimeter by 5 millimeter. And the whole chip is around the size uh, of a quarter. And uh, uh, we put different colors in each layer so we can see better. So the green layer is the filter layer, the red layer is the cell or drug layer, and the yellow layer is the uh, uh, oxygen layer or the gas layer. Fascinating. So um, you, you, where, where in the pipeline is this towards, uh, I mean, is it still a product within the University of Michigan? Are you guys looking to, you know, see this actually come to clinical use? Or where is uh, this? Currently, uh, currently uh, it's still within our group. Usually, we make uh, uh, we make in our lab, and we give them to our collaborators, and uh, they will do a test with it, and uh, maybe uh, get some data and write some papers uh, on that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I I wish I wish we can kind of. Uh, uh, commercialize it. I mean, <laughs> uh, yes, but I mean it's not uh, uh, as as easy as you imagine. I mean, I know a lot of uh, professors or groups they commercialize their technologies or things like that. But mm, I don't know. Maybe the culture in our group is a bit different. Although myself, I'm I'm always attracted to commercialize something. <laughs> <laughs> You know, well, uh, capitalism. Yeah. <laughs> well, but you know, it's, it brings up an interesting debate because uh, unless you go through industry and commercialization, how uh, this technology will maybe never be able to see the use in in patients or in some kind of clinical re in a public relevance. You know, 
Um, yes. It's, it's, a nice de- it's an interesting debate to have. Like, are, are we pursuing, you know, there's a, there's a school of thought that true pursuit of knowledge should not be tainted by selfish, uh, I guess, some kind of material want or need, right? So mm-hmm. it, it's always a debate versus that, versus mm-hmm. the more counter view to that, which is unless you see this stuff making it to market, how would you ever really appreciate its use in a practical standpoint? Mm-hmm. It's fascinating technology. I mean, it could really, you know, certainly change the way we uh, diagnose and do treatments for cancer. Mm-hmm. Um, they're very interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is. I, I think uh, definitely, uh, definitely, you have more, you have more experience uh, on starting a company or making technologies commercialized. Uh, I have been always thinking of that, but uh, it might be a bit more difficult for me to start something. Uh, and as I, as, as we we might all, all all see that there are always a lot of things going on in research, but only very few of them is get commercialized or something. So I don't know, maybe there is some steps we might take. For example, maybe first steps, we want to uh, expand our applications. For example, we want to uh, develop more collaborations, uh, having more people try our technology or try our chips. And also, currently, I know, uh, I'm not sure is it same for every group, country, uh, especially for the uh, professors or the PIs, they are very busy with the funding applications. Uh, that's the uh, number one stuff they are focusing on. <laughs> and uh, maybe they are not having too much time to doing this kind of uh, uh, media coverage or to spread their technology or to commercialize some stuff. You know, um, you bring up a beautiful Point because I, you know, there is definitely a lot of stigma in academia that you know if you consider industry or you um, talk a lot about your technology, there's a certain taboo that comes with it. But you know the, the the new generation of science and people that like yourself, you know, you're coming from a different country, you're migrating here, you, you're learning the science, you're learning you know how to certainly doing cutting edge research. It's it's a powerful tool that you you know a lot of getting grants for the future is really learning to sell your research and getting out there and you know certainly this you know, coming on to the show and speaking about your research is a, a great first step. So I commend you on that that you know you're taking those steps early as opposed to later. Mm-hmm. Excuse me, just for a second, uh, <clears throat> Zia, you're you're on screen share, so just get off screen share so okay. we can see you, or or if you're going to screen share, then. Whatever. Okay. Okay. Sorry about you. Uh, it's okay. It's yeah. okay. Go ahead, Zia. You were gonna you gonna continue presenting any more figures? Uh, yeah. I think I I, I can continue. I I, I think what uh, you talk is also uh, what you just said is also very interesting. Actually, I'm I'm not so sure about um, the conditions of, uh, for example, uh, for example, for for our this kind of. Uh, uh, immigrants or our this kind of stu- uh, international students. Uh, usually, we are facing a lot of uh, difficulties or different kind of conditions. For example, for example, for me, uh, uh, I have a concern that if I want to do this kind of, uh, for example, commercialization uh, in US here, uh, I might need to sacrifice a lot. For example, uh, for this kind of stuff. Uh, you might need to do a lot of things which is not so meaningful in terms of uh, research uh, because to do commercialization, one very important factor is you want to make sure your product works very well. So the uh, reliability is very important. But in terms of research, is actually not that important. You maybe have 10 chips or even you have a lot, uh, 100 chips. And you have maybe only one of them work, and you get very beautiful result, and you can get a very good publication. But you cannot sell it actually because the yield is too low, and uh, people don't want to buy stuff that doesn't work. And if we want to do this kind of uh, 
efforts on reliability is it's very essential and important for commercialization, also for industry. But for example, for me, I might I might have some other considerations. For example, maybe I need to uh, keep my status first. I, I mean, if I sacrifice a lot of things to do this, I might got any return in a short term period, and uh, I have some restrictions. I cannot do everything I want here because, for example, I have to be a student, keep my F1 status here, or mm -hmm. I, f I need to find a job in some company uh, to keep another kind of uh, working visa status. Otherwise, I will be sent back sure. to China. <laughs> yeah. so, I, mean, I think what you're saying is, what you're saying, like, as, as exciting as a prospect sound, it's still not the most... Um, it's not the most conducive to. It's very high risk, is what you're getting at. It's still yeah. in a lot of barriers to. But it's it's interesting. It's a very interesting debate. I mean, you see, like the research you're presenting is very novel. I mean, is this concept of building these chips? I mean, the yeah. applications for the industry could be tremendous. Um, mm -hmm. But very interesting, yeah. Mm -hmm. Very interesting mm -hmm. debate. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, I think I might. Uh, uh, continue a bit more uh, sure. with my paper, okay. and uh, yeah. So uh, let me do first. So screen share. So this is a chip uh, made. I just mentioned, and uh, this is, this is some setups we uh, did and some simulations, and uh, I'd like to lead to the cell test result. So these are some other tests. These are the so this is actually how the uh, filter layer will look like. So it will have uh, repeated pat patterns of grayscale. So you have uh, highest light illumination at the most transparent area, and you have the lowest uh, light illumination at the uh, lowest transparent area. So that's how we generate the gradient of light. And here's an example of the uh, Cell test result. Uh, here we use uh, the cell called uh, C6, uh, which is a, a brain tumor cell, mm -hmm. and uh, we applied the gradient of these three parameters. One is jog, and one is oxygen, and the other is uh, light illumination. So the most transparent area is having the highest uh, light illumination, and we can see uh, if the oxygen goes up or the uh, jog goes up or the illumination intensity goes up, it helps kill the uh, cancer cells. And we we load another script uh, to collect this kind of data because one concern for uh, high support technology is you can uh, you can do a lot of tests, uh, mm -hmm. you can have a lot of results on the device or on the petri dish or on the microwave plate. But another concern is, do we have an automatic way to automatically connect this data and do the analysis on this data? And uh, I, I dare not to say we are very good at it. We, we, we are just a very normal engineering student, so we wrote some script using uh, MATLAB uh, to uh, analysis this kind of uh, images. So we read in those kind of images, and we compare the uh, red color and green color, because red color means uh, the cell is dead, and green color means the cell is still alive. And we compare the uh, uh, color uh, intensity of these images, and we uh, calculate the ratio, and we plot into a 3D format to see how the viability changes according to the light, the oxygen, and the jug. And the jug we use here is still a, a, a Molecule jug. It's called mastering blue. It's a pretty common dye, and uh, we have some other nano jug results. Uh, it's but it's not uh, included so, in this paper. I, I will show you later. So basically, when you deliver the photosensitizer into the cancer cell and it gets mm -hmm. it up, it just causes cell destruction, right? Mm, yes. So uh, when when uh, if uh, we only deliver the jug. So long as the concentration is not too high, uh, it will not damage the cells. But if you shine the light on, it will uh, immediately damage the so cells. So basically, so if I'm if I'm summarizing this right, 
-hmm. you have a device that mm -hmm. uh, basically suggests that this X compound is compatible with photodynamic therapy or not compatible with photodynamic therapy, or is it equivalent photosensitizer for use in a photodynamic therapy setting? Uh, yes. Uh, so, mm, is that a reasonable? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, I think it is reasonable. Uh, a one basic uh, function of this uh, chip or the technology is just as you said to see how the drug candidates, how well it works. I mean, it's if it's not working so well, you can shine light, but it didn't kill the cancer cells. But it works very well. You just give a very weak light, it can also kill the cancer cells. Okay. So then do you think, do you foresee potential drug candidates that you're screening as uh, affecting the clinical use of PDT as mm -hmm. something that could transition to a clinical use of PDT? Yeah, I think so. Actually, the drug uh, we tested uh, uh, in, 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 in our paper, uh, the methylene blue, it's not uh, approved. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's generally approved for, uh, by FDA, but it's, it hasn't been approved by FDA for cancer treatment yet. So it has the potential for application in cancers. So that's the reason we pick this kind of uh, chemical. And also one advantage of this chemical compared to current uh, drugs uh, is it requires much weak light. So it's a much stronger uh, drug compared to counter commercialized drugs. Okay. Yeah. And uh, do you have any other findings you'd like to share? Or? Uh, yes, I, I think I, I can also share a bit uh, about our nanoparticle results. Yeah. Uh, so the, we, I mean, we nanoparticle, also have nanoparticles uh, basically serves as a carrier for the actual drug into the cancer cell, at which point you light, you use PDT to cause destruction of the cell, right? Yes, I so think it, it's, it carries the. It basically carries the photosensitizer into the cancer cell yes, for exactly. PDT. Yes. Hey, John. Do we, by any chance, have any questions from Twitter yet? Uh, let me check, uh, Kristen. Let me check. Mm. Yes, there's one question about <clears throat> Tazia. Mm -hmm. Apparently, you mentioned something about uh, that drug's not approved by the FDA for cancer use. What is the drug used for? Uh, uh, country, you know? there, uh, country, there is uh, uh, there are three kind of drugs uh, approved by FDA uh, mm -hmm. for photodynamic therapy. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not so good at, I'm, I'm not usually so good at remember all these names. I can, I can, but I can, let me see. I think I can find it very quickly. Okay, and then you can tweet it when you find out. Yeah, so, I, okay. John, I mean, is the, is the concept of PDT make sense? Is that uh, something you got, it's kind of been followed? I mean, do we, does, does it make sense the way Lou presented it? Yes, it does. Uh, I, I know that... Uh, well, that's basically your field, Christian, right? Manipulation yeah, yeah. of molecules, in fact, in fact, manipulation of molecules by light, yeah. magnetism, and liquid. Yeah, it's fascinating. I mean, a lot of the uh, uh, head and neck cancers they they've been using PDT for a long time. I mean, photodynamic therapy has been quite around. Because the problem is, you know, the reason why it's so important is head and neck cancers are not very surgically treatable. So, for example, let's say you had a huge tumor. Um, somewhere in the esophagus or in your trachea or um, certain um, you know places that are inaccessible through surgical I mean obviously everything can be accessible but you looking at uh, operative complications sometimes this idea of minimally invasive uh, procedures have a lot of clinical relevance because you're now you know imagine if all you had to do was put a tube down and you're able to just hit the light on the areas that are affected by cancer without having to actually do a huge incision that's that's a huge huge benefit to the public so I mean it's got a lot of clinical Im implications I mean I think people you know 
you can really bring it, distill it down to a very practical standpoint. You know, you go to an operator, you take an eight-hour operation, you can make a minimally, minimally invasive procedure that could take anywhere from an hour to hour and a half. Um, so the concept in itself is fantastic. Well, it's yeah. an interesting uh, observation about head neck cancers being, I guess, treated by radiation, essentially, right? Radiation chemo and not by surgery. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, you, you know, any time, yeah, it's not it's not that it's it's the idea that yes, head and neck cancers can be treated with surgery. It's just certain types of, you know, you always you know, when you think about cancer treatment, chemo radiation is one option, surgery is one option. Um, you know, the National Cancer Institute publishes guidelines on how best to treat certain types of cancers and they they all have guidelines that, you know, include risks and benefits of each types of procedures. But PDT is an interesting phenomenon because it, it's just looking at a very practical technology that's pushing the use of minimally invasive type of treatment that's not necessarily doing an aggressive surgical intervention. So, it, you know, it certainly right. has a huge clinical role in the future, if not already. I'm sure Lou would agree with that, right? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree. Actually, I think um, people their opinions about uh, cancer or the opinion about how to cure cancer is always changing, especially nowadays. And uh, previously I read a paper from uh, uh, MHO, uh, I guess, and they said uh, recently people are taking cancer not as something uh, people can really readily uh, cure or readily get rid of. They are more likely to consider those uh, Mm, those uh, diseases as uh, a chronic disease or people need very comprehensive uh, or combined therapies to treat uh, these kind of uh, different situations and a lot of uh, papers in the research today people working on drugs or ch uh, therapies they are not really uh, they are only they are only following the patients for several years. For example, if you survived for uh, three years or even for six months or something, they think this kind of therapy uh, somehow uh, cured the cancer because a lot of cancer actually comes back uh, after a long period maybe. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and think about, it, especially with uh, something like where you think a lot recurrences of cancers are really uh, frequent, then imagine having to have repeat surgeries versus something like PDT, which is a much more, uh, less, uh, you know, causes less morbidity or post-operative, you know, the procedure itself is not as taxing on the body itself. So, um, I mean, it, 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 you can appreciate, John, I think what, what I'm trying to distill is, I, I don't know, people who are watching, you can appreciate where someone like uh, Lou's research, which is screening for these type of um, better photosensitizers for PDT could have huge clinical implications. I mean, you could rethink the way some kind of these research is could really impact how in a decade or so from now how post-operative complications and cost savings in healthcare can happen from such a simple technology. You know, and, and it's it's very interesting. I, I find it really profound. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think it's more lo locating the lesion. Uh, that is a strong point of this uh, research, uh, Christian and, and Zia. Is it's a strong is localization, the exact localization of the tumor, and you're not killing uh, healthy cells. Uh, yes, I mean, uh, it. For example, for uh, chemotherapy, you will uh, have the drug uh, affecting the whole body, but for this kind of therapy. Uh, it only affects the position you shine the light on it, so that's why it is localized. And that, so localizing that is, the lesion, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And Make also it more I, specific. Yeah, and also I put the name of the three drugs uh, in the chatting session here. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm not very good at reading drug names, so maybe you can help me. These are these are the three drugs country approved. For, yeah, it's actually. Uh, yeah. Photofrin aminolevulinic acid and uh, metvixia. 
actually, yeah, and they're all methyl esters. Yeah, so I've actually heard of photoprin. Um, mm -hmm. and, I, and I think aminolibulinic acid is also f common for PDT, but, you know, actually PDT, most times for clinical, I've only seen it usually done by derm dermatology groups, like, that are treating, like, you know, clinicians that are using the technology are typically dermatologists that are certain treating types, certain types of cancers, more superficial. Um, so I've heard of photofrin quite frequently, um, but interesting. So you are basically trying to find replacements for these type of drugs that are more uh, suitable for PDT compatible technology. Uh, yes, actually, uh, yes, I think uh, maybe it's, it's more... Uh, uh, Complex than that? Uh, I don't know. I I, I think uh, it's more like maybe I'm helping people to find uh, the the placement for these drugs. Sure. So the drug company will be will not be mad at me, <laughs> but will be mad at my collaborators. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, because I can I can also help the drug company too. I mean I can help them. Right. Uh, you're 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 basically the guy who's screen. You're <laughs> creating a technology that's screening the new novel compounds that could be compatible with this technology as well. Yeah. Uh, yes, I think so. Yeah. You're a smart man, Lou. Trying to avoid <laughs> uh, trouble with drug companies, huh? Uh, no, I just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Interesting. Okay. Mm -hmm. So. Um, okay, gentlemen. Uh, uh, Christian, any more any more questions to ask? No, no. I think I think maybe we could make this last segment just to go over a few articles, and then um, you know I think we could conclude this show. Yeah, sure. Sure, that sounds good. That sounds mm -hmm. good, sure. uh, Zia. Great. And if you feel free to uh, make any remarks if you if you like. Let me get this on. Get a, get this screen share myself. Mm -hmm. uh, things don't work so quick sometimes with all this being with it. Yeah. Just give me a second, gentlemen. Mm -hmm. Some reason it's working here. How long? How much longer is this search going to last, uh, Zia? Do you, do you stay in this project for for an X amount of days, or? Mm, I think I have uh, been working on this for like two to three years. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. From okay, the start, I I work on something. Okay. Else. Now 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 I've got it. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm getting it. I'm getting. I'm making them chilling. There's one article, especially Kristen, that mm -hmm. caught my eye. I'd like to get your uh, sure. feedback on. Um, it's an article where the Abbey uh, here mm. visualizing now vi individual viruses, uh, and they actually have a video of visualization of a virus trying to enter a cell. Uh, which oh. is which is unbelievable. Yeah, let me. Did you, can you see the article now? Yeah, yeah. A video of virus, video of virus-sized particle trying to enter cell. Now, as we discussed in prior weekly chats, we we can't show videos on this Google Google uh, hang, Hangout platform. However, mm -hmm. there's a picture there, and if you can see this little purple dot, that's a virus. And if you watch the video, you can actually see the virus trying to enter a living cell, which is which is quite fantastic. You know mm -hmm. the, the advances of uh, na nano medicine, nanotechnology at visualizing down to the molecular area. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I've I've never seen a video like this. And it's essentially trying to infect uh, the cell. So I wish I wish we could show the video, but but I can provide a, a link on the Nano Medicine Weekly page if anyone out there is interested in seeing it. The article was from Nature Nanotechnology, mm -hmm. um, and the article is multi-resolution: the early stages of cellular uptake of peptide-coated nanoparticles. It's wow. very interesting. Um, mm -hmm. Let me see if there's another article uh, that catches your eye. Uh, mm -hmm. Christian. <clears throat> okay. Um, okay. Artificial muscle. That's not. I didn't really go into that too much. 
tumor cell finding a few foes among billions of cellular friends. Again, it's the old, uh, you know, trying to trying to kill the uh, cancer and not the other cells. That's another article about about that. Let me, let me click in here. Maybe we, we can see some more details. Can you guys read the the, the print there, or yeah, we or just the headlines. It's, it's that it's much okay. clearer than usual weeks. Is excellent. Mm -hmm. Okay. John, I think your your video got switched out. You... Okay. Oh, you didn't get you don't get the screen share. No, I'm seeing share? it. No, I'm seeing it. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Um. Okay. Let me just go back here to it. Uh. Okay. Tumor cells finding a few foes among billions of cells, beating cancers by early detection. Researchers have constructed an ultra sensitive nanoprobe that can electrochemically sense as few as four circulating tumor cells. Now that is fantastic resolution if they can detect four cancer cells. Mm -hmm. you know, it just seems like a matter of time before, before scientists will be able to exactly delineate the borders of a cancer. Oh man, imagine the, the impact that could have. Yeah, tremendous. Tremendous. So many surgeries, you know, the patients will come back having to have repeat surgeries because some of the cancer cells are missed and then they regrow. Um, mm -hmm. This is a very powerful reason why nanotechnology, I mean, you're now taking an order of magnitude that's 10 to the minus 9 in terms of resolution or uh, delineating what part is cancers versus not. I mean, phenomenal. That kind of brings up a question I have. Uh, do surgeons, are they keeping close eye on nanotechnology do you think you think some surgeons are kind of kind of keeping tabs with what's going on um, well I mean I'll tell you like we um, you know I'm, I'm working on a uh, you know a paper um, that I think hopefully will be published shortly but uh, the concept is in especially with uh, brain tumors and uh, head and neck or brain cancers that have some relevance. Uh, I think there are some actual clinical trials that have been done uh, using nanomaterials for treating of uh, you know some type of aggressive advanced brain tumors. So it's around, but it still again hasn't uh, really hit the mainstream. Um, right. Again, because I, I think unfortunately, you know, it's just it's not hit the kind of uh, uh, progress that the FDA really or the the public would want from the FDA and the government primarily because of issues with safety concerns in terms of toxicity etc but uh, right. I, mean, I think uh, yeah if 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 the idea of knowing even at a at a nanometer scale and being sure that you've gotten all the tumor out I mean you could change cost savings so drastically in healthcare because so many times you see patients come back from repeat surgeries because they just haven't gotten um, all the tumor out the first time. So it's not that uncommon for something like that to happen. Okay, very good. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, I think that wraps That's it up, gentlemen. Fantastic. Um, so Dia, thank, I appreciate, appreciate you yeah. coming uh, from, from the wilds of the Wolverines in Michigan. And Christian, mm -hmm. thank you for coming right from the hospital from your sure. emergency. Uh, I, I, I love hosting this show every week, John, and a uh, fabulous job today. As you can see, John is a fantastic, not only is he, uh, you know, he does a beautiful job producing this show every week. Uh, yeah, he is. You know, he, he takes the time to put it to get the technical part done, and, uh, uh, you know, really appreciate your it's a, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a true pleasure. And Christian, does that mean I'm going to get a raise? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> My salary yeah. is double. It's double. Yeah, yeah. I'm okay, sure the, the website looks good and the process is very comfortable. It's a very nice show, I think. I agree. Yeah, and, and, and you know, certainly let um, people know. I, I'll tell you, it's, it's very interesting. I, I, last week we had a um, guest on our show who was this, uh, from Ukraine that was doing these medical graphics. And um, mm -hmm. uh, John, I just got an email from a, mm -hmm. a very uh, from an author that he published a very big book on nanomedicine in Canada, and he mm -hmm. actually saw the show. Oh, and great! Uh -huh. You he knew Yuri, and he actually will appear on our show in the next couple of weeks and talk oh, to us. Oh, fantastic! 
and he oh, was uh, right. featured on uh, CBN and a lot of big journal uh, news newspapers and articles. So hopefully, I can get him to lock in a date. So my point being that you know, you know, you should feel you should feel really um, happy to s talk about your research because I think definitely this that people are watching and uh, I think they'll appreciate. Right. appreciate yeah, sure, it. sure. I'm 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 very thankful for. For yeah. inviting me here, and also I, I, I revealed all the previous uh, shows you have on the website. Yeah. Uh, it's very interesting. Uh, people are talking on different topics, and I also see the uh, last show uh, talking about the animation and the graphics. Yeah. Uh, it's it's especially very. I mean, I don't know other people, but it's very attractive to our researchers. We yeah. especially for biological applications or papers, we need a lot of good. Pictures, images, or animations to yeah. do the demonstrations and to hit the point and show it in a easy, understanding way. It's very important. Yeah. So, Lou, uh, don't uh, blame me or John if you start to get a lot of emails from pharma companies. <laughs> technology. Oh, of course. <laughs> okay. It's all John's fault. <laughs> well, listen, Zia. Anytime you're, you're welcome to come back. If you have any other stuff that you want to show us, or any of your uh, your research buddies. That if there's any, okay, sure. anything that you think will be interesting, you guys are welcome to come back. Sure. Okay. Certainly, I'm, let I'm, every, certainly let everybody know in the scientific community that you interact with to mm -hmm. watch uh, 9 p.m. on Wednesdays, okay? Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Uh, have a good night. Very nice. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay, too. hold on. You guys, I'll uh, talk to you after the broadcast is over. All good right. night, everybody. Good night. Bye-bye.